next. And our uh, Assistant Director General, Tofik Jelassi, joins us uh, um, for the panel. So uh, bear with us for a little bit, uh, three minutes more. Thank you very much. Okay, colleagues, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to start. Uh, let me call our moderator, uh, Cedric Walshwoods, uh, to join the panel. Thank you very much. Hello and a very warm welcome to you. Apologize, uh, apologies for being late. I'm Swiss and it provides me physical pain to come three minutes late. <laughs> so I'm sorry for that. Uh, we were caught in traffic from the African Union and even the driver hadn't foreseen on this kind of um, jams on the way. A warm welcome uh, to all of you participants online and in the room and uh, particularly also uh, to our panelists uh, here and apologies also to them for, for being late. Um, we have here to the right the Assistant Director General, uh, Dr. Tofik Jalassi, Dr. Ubena, who will join us online. Mr. No, he's not there. Mr. Ope Olugasa hasn't uh, arrived yet. Yes, I, I should well, I'm here online. Oh, you're online. Thank you. Happy to hear. Uh, this is Dr. Ubena or um, Mr. Olugasa who's speaking? Because we can't see you, see you yet. Um, yeah, this is Okwe Olugasa. Oh, very nice to, to, to have you on board too. Um, and uh, Ms. Linda Banjo and also uh, Misako Ito, um, are my colleague from UNESCO Nairobi. Uh, so, dear participants, today we will learn an exchange about the e-judiciary and how ICTs and I AI tools can be a solution for enhancing the administration of justice, but we will also consider the related challenges and the changing role of judicial actors worldwide in the aim to uphold the rule of law and in the A AI era. Um, now I have the pleasure to invite Dr. 
Tofik Jilasi, UNESCO's Assistant Director General for Communication and Information, to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Since uh, we are starting this session uh, a bit late due to the matter that Cedric explained, I'll try to shorten my remarks to try to help us be back on schedule. Uh, excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, I'm very pleased to be with you here for this special uh, workshop on artificial intelligence and uh, justice. As I suppose uh, many of you, if not all of you know, UNESCO has been very active for close to 10 years now in organizing training programs for judicial operators, judges, public prosecutors, judiciary operators worldwide. Uh, this uh, training has consisted very much on updating judiciary operators on regional and international standards in the fields of freedom of expression, safety of journalists, freedom of the press, and access to information. To date, we have trained over 24,000 judges, prosecutors, judiciary operators in 150 countries. But of course, the question became, what's next? And we know in the digital technology uh, side, we know of one very promising technology, artificial intelligence, and uh, we decided to look at what new opportunities, what new applications can AI offer to the judiciary operators, but also what are the maybe uh, the risks involved, what are the, the, uh, the things to watch out for. So recently, actually last spring, more speci specifically last March, we launched a massive open online course on AI and the rule of law. We believe this is a quite unique uh, offering. Certainly it's the first of its kind in the UN system, but maybe also from international organizations. We were delighted that in this first offering of the online course on AI and the rule of law, we had over 4,500 judges, prosecutors, and judiciary operators enrolled in this course and following it uh, th uh, th throughout. Personally, I received some email messages from few people who after 48 or 36 hours, we said, we completed the course. I was very impressed because these people, it meant that these people really took the course almost on a full-time basis not just one hour from time to time or a weekend per week to complete the whole course in a matter of uh, three days. Uh, so this is very important. I believe this is, uh, AI, I, as we know, can help uh, streamline, can help redesign, can help simplify some of the processes uh, involved in the, uh, in the judicial administration. But more than that, if you look at the subset of AI, which is case-based reasoning, uh, certainly, this uh, technology can also help judges and public pro prosecutors learn from past cases when they are processing a case uh, uh, at hand. So I think this is very powerful. We saw applications in a number of countries. UK is one of them. South Africa is another one. Just to mention a couple, an African country and a European country where we saw uh, promising applications. But for us, we have to be loyal to what UNESCO has been advocating for a number of years. And you heard at this IGF event, the Rome X framework of UNESCO. That is, when we use technology, when we develop and deploy and design technology-based systems and applications, we anchor that in Rome, again, R for human rights-based approach, O standing for open to all, A accessible by all, and M, following a multi-stakeholder approach. So this applies to AI systems as well. We have to fully respect the human rights. We have to respect human dignity. We have to be sensitive to gender equality. So there are a number of issues that we believe are central to this piece of work, especially since last year when 
UNESCO came up and had approved by 193 member states the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. This is the first normative instrument of its kind in the world, uh, an in-depth look at the ethical side of AI, and we are delighted when it was unanimously approved by 193 countries covering the five continents. So I think this is a major develop, the development that we have to take into account. Why? Because we know about AI applications, example, in uh, fa facial recognition. You know, is that something good that we can allow that, you know, in some countries for some maybe systems, including the police, whatever, we can use AI to recognize people's faces and to use that data for digital surveillance. So again, I'm just flagging some of the issues that AI brought to the fore that did not exist in the, in past, uh, with past technologies. Uh, uh, we have been working with partners, of course, uh, uh, the Future Society, which is a co-organizer of this uh, workshop session today here, and we acknowledge and we are grateful for the collaboration with the Future Society. Other key partners with whom we collaborated, the African Commission on Human Rights, and on people's rights, uh, and uh, as I said, Cedric said, we just came back from a meeting at the African Union where we have other ongoing collaboration projects. But also, we have been working with the regional courts, including in Africa, namely the African Court on Human and People's Rights, but also the ECOWAS Court of Justice, that is the Court of Justice of the Economic Community of West African States. And finally, another key partner, the East African Court of Justice, among others. So this is not just UNESCO necessarily by itself. This is UNESCO collaborating with other stakeholders, with other partners who bring in their thematic knowledge, field expertise, but also sometimes the regional context in which we want to apply AI and the rule of law. Let me, uh, let me stop here because uh, we have uh, some... Um, high-level speakers, panelists, to uh, share with us their insights, their experiences, and best practices. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure that, you know, at the end of this session, hopefully we'll have new ideas that could help us pave the road going forward. Thank you all, physically and also online, being part of this session. Uh, thank you so much, ADG, for this overview of um, the current work and global work which is being undertaken. And as you highlighted, uh, this is very much about regional activities on AI in the justice system and all of the five interventions we will hear. Actually, four will be really coming from Africa, only one uh, from India, a very good example, and, and um, Proposition 2. Now, we are having... Uh, the difficulties of bringing Judge Dr. Ubena um, online, um, so we will continue. He is there. We are we are we are working on it, um, and I will therefore uh, delay uh, this presentation. And we will uh, give the floor now to Mr. Ope Ulugasa, who is the CEO of Law Pavillon, and he's working on strengthening the justice system through introduction of innovative solution to address the obstacles faced by the judiciary. And he will, as I just mentioned before, have a particular look at AI in the African judiciary and look also at context-related challenges and how new tools can be used to support justice in Africa while upholding the rule of law. So uh, thank you for joining us online and um, you have the floor. Five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, permit me to share my screen. We hear you very well, but we see you in person and not this, um, no presentation yet. Um, so I'm not allowed to sh share my screen yet. Um, host has disabled that. I don't know if the host can allow me to share my screen so I can just speak to it. Right. You um, Are you... Okay. Great. So... Okay, I guess you can see my screen now. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon. Um, 
Thank you so much for um, this invitation. I'll just speak very briefly to the need for technology and artificial intelligence in Afghan judiciary. Lessons from Nigeria. My name is Ope Ulugasa um, from Law Pavilion. And our mission, simple, is equipping the justice system to enable people and businesses achieve their potentials. Um, so what's the problem statement in Nigerian judiciary? I'll just look at this data here to make it a little bit graphic. This is for a particular magistrate court between January 2019 and May 2020. I can see there the statistics for concluded matters for civil matters, 219, pending cases, 452. In criminal, 872 were concluded within that period, 1,194 are pending cases within that period, and 4,295 new cases on criminal matters were filed during that period. Now, you will agree with me, and this is what um, has shaped some of the uh, inter technology interventions, that this is a troubling potential disaster waiting to happen because the rate at which new matters are being filed in court, the court system in Nigeria, and I believe that's also the same thing across Africa, the court system cannot um, keep up with that pace. And no wonder um, statistics recently from Hill actually says that 36% of these people actually just resort to self-action. And so next, and that's actually the root cause for some of the symptoms we're seeing in our own um, in our own climate here, insecurity and quite a number of uh, number of such. Now, so what are the solutions that we we have preferred as um, law, at Law Pavilion? Now we've concluded that human intelligence alone is no longer enough. So we needed to integrate technology. We needed to integrate artificial intelligence to help enhance human intelligence in justice delivery in legal practice in Nigeria. Now, what are the interventions we have um, in we introduced essentially across two broad um, broad areas? One, uh, first one is e-library, that's electronic library and electronic legal research. Now for these two, what we did, we introduced um, electronic law reports into the system so that judges, instead of spending 50% of their time looking for authorities using um, hard man, hard cover, um, hard books, now we, we digitize that. Um, then we annotated the laws of the federation. So it becomes what I said, when I say annotated, it means each section of the law is explained with cases. So judicial case, um, authorities that have, that have interpreted those laws, we actually put them together. Now this makes it easier for judges to quickly look at the provisions of the law and then quickly identify precedents on that to inter properly interpret the provisions of the law. Then we have an appellate feedback system for judges. Now, what this does is to help them enhance the quality of their judgments. So if a court, uh, a judge in a lower court delivers a judgment, yes, it goes to a higher court on appeal. Now, when the appeal court, appellate court makes a, um, takes a decision on that, the lower court judge is notified that this is the position of the appellate court on it so that subsequently the, the lower court judge can then correct um, himself or, or self. Then we also introduced legal analytics. Part of the challenges we've had here in our clients is conflicting judgments, you know, quite a number of sorts. Now we actually compile this together. So on each principle of law, we will show the conflicts, we show the exceptions, and then we show the history of those um, of those of, of that authority in in the in our in, in our cases i'm sorry in our jurisprudence so it becomes easier for judges to take the um to take decisions promptly of course with quality at the back of their minds then we introduce electronic textbooks a lot, a lot of textbooks and journals still on the platform and then uh, more recently we then introduce artificial intelligence assisted document review this is a form of a judicial decision support system so when lawyers file matters in court the um, usually in Nigeria, we, they, they come to them, they have written addresses. So instead of the judge having to first read the written address, then try to find out what it used to be, um, to be, um, to be formulated on it, the system automatically takes in the whole written address and then searches through the precedents to bring out related cases that have dealt with such uh, matters before and then extracts all the um, legal authorities within that, um, that written address so that the judge can easily have a summary of it and then look at the authorities, the references, and then look at cases that are related and it becomes easier for the judges to take their decision and then um, educate on those matters. So that's the first um, the, the first intervention. The second broad level intervention is, um, we call it e-registry. So essentially it's about electronic filing of court processes instead of having to do everything manually. But the, the intervention we put on this 
is actually with timestamps. So it, it helps track timing, how fast um, the officials, the court officials quickly respond to matters that are filed online. Then electronic payments, electronic service of court processes. Service of court process was uh, um, a major challenge also here in our climb. And then this solution is helping to serve that electronically. And then the proof of service is easily um, gotten at the court. Then notification of schedule electronically as well. And then we also introduced case management system that helps manage the workflow of uh, matters in court. It calculates the average age of cases in court. We, ordinarily, it takes um, a, a number of years, about five years for high court. And then uh, on the average, about 20, 30 years to prosecute a matter from high court to Supreme Court in Nigeria. And then, so in, in with the criminal system, we're keeping a tab on the average age of the case so that judges can quickly dispose the cases before them. And then what are the visible outcomes on um, in this over a period of 10 years? Now, I'll measure this in terms of the growth in number of cases disposed at the Court of Appeal between 2009 and 2019. And this is the and there's a graph from 2009 up to 2019. And with this, with when we introduced technology to them in 2012, I introduced um, local institutions to them in 2012. Now, in the last couple of years, there has been 200% increase in the, in the uh, annual cases, um, judgments given by the Court of Appeal. This is three times um, improvement. And we think that with better appreciation, with better... Um, um, adoption of technology, the, um, the justice system in Nigeria can even do more. The same thing with um, within Africa. Now, having looked at this, we also then move on to, to consider um, um, other AI solutions. Now, so we just recently introduced something, we call it a new disruption in civil and criminal justice system in Nigeria. And I'll just play um, briefly a, a one and a half minute video to demonstrate what we have done. And this is essentially really rethinking the, uh, the, um, the acquisition of justice in Nigeria using artificial intelligence and blockchain such that we're bringing justice really closer to the people, especially to solve the challenge of insecurity in Nigeria um, and then um, reforming the criminal justice system in terms of um, evidence, crowdsourcing of evidence, um, profiling of suspects and others. Just let me play the video in, let's say, two, one and a half minutes. Introducing Just Ease, your social legal app for community security and easy access to justice. The Just Ease app empowers you to know your rights and duties and so it's okay. Speak up whenever your rights are violated. The Community Security Watch feature provides you prompt notification on reported crimes in your area or community in seconds, empowering everyone to speak up and report every crime, whether you are the victim or not. The panic button lets you signal for help when you are in trouble. This immediately shares your GPS coordinates with your pre-selected contacts and alerts police around you to come to your rescue. You can also access a comprehensive directory of lawyers or police stations near you. Oh, one more thing. The real ingenuity of Just Ease is its dashboards that rely on the power of GPS, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technologies to form a reliable and tamper-proof digital evidence bank available for investigators, lawyers, and judges in a format that is admissible before the court. Its crowdsourcing model of evidence and crime information gathering within any location in Nigeria and the artificial intelligence facial recognition feature embedded in the dashboards enable the profiling of any criminal suspect by running it through a crowdsourced evidence bank stored in the blockchain. Much more, the dashboards measure and calculate the rule of law index for every state in Nigeria. Now your safety is in your hands. Download Just Ease today on Google Play Store. Just Ease, disrupting the civil and criminal justice system in Africa. Now, this uh, um, is what we have just done recently, and we're producing artificial intelligence to integrate crowdsourcing of um, crime information that's admissible um, in the courts in Nigeria. So it becomes easier. It's a disruption to the criminal justice system and even civil justice system in Nigeria because part of what we are doing right now is such that um, the common man on the streets can easily file a matter via this app, and then digital courts can easily take it up. So it's a form of online distribution um, system as well, because the common man on the streets need to be served justice. And these are the ways we've been doing this, and we're still pushing this in Nigeria to ensure that um, artificial intelligence becomes the mainstream in, um, in combating crime, 
and criminal justice system. Thank you so much. So in conclusion, my idea of the future of justice delivery in Africa is um, it's shown where cases are concluded in less than one year. Right now, it takes about 15 to 30 years to conclude all through the, um, the three tiers of, 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 um, of, of, of courts in Nigeria. And um, using artificial intelligence, this can be much better, much faster. And that's what we, uh, we're doing at Lopa Region. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olugasa. And um, these were very interesting lessons from Nigeria. Uh, you pointed first out the challenges, like 4,300 cases filed for duration of criminal cases, but also the growth of cases at appeal with a 200% growth, and but also some opportunities uh, like the legal analytics, but also, of course, a few challenging parts. I think the easy app, uh, just ease app, um, could be discussed uh, from a human rights perspective and uh, from uh, the 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 part, part of the the face recognition, the digital evidence based um, per, um, uh, pursuits, um, also the AI assistant document review. So we will have time for discussion a little bit later. I, I ask you to please reserve your questions and points for a little bit later. We will now first hear um, Miss Aishavarya Girita. Um, who is uh, working in the technology and society team at the Center for Communication Governance in New Delhi University. And her work primarily focuses on issues relating to data protection, internet governance, intermediary liability, and emerging technologies, but also, of course, on opportunities and challenges related to the digitalization and use of AI in the judiciary. So you have the floor. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you to the Assistant Director General for having opened the, the floor and he has other appointments. So. Hi, am I audible? Well, great. Um, so I work in civil society, so I guess my job is to uh, introduce a few roadblocks into our thinking about AI and uh, quick deployment. And, um, and I think we can all agree in general, this is also an issue that tends to come up in India, is that uh, we do need faster disposal of cases. Justice delivery does take an exorbitantly long period of time. And so I do think there are ways in which we can use technology to make that process a little bit better. Um, but I did want to highlight three broad challenges uh, or three things that we need to think about when we're using AI technologies in the judiciary and more generally in law enforcement as well. Um, so one is with respect to transparency and the concept of trust in the judiciary. Uh, the second is with respect to the challenges with digitization and infrastructural capacity. And the third is with respect to privacy. Um, so if we, if we start at a very basic level, um, I know that this is an issue in developing countries, for example. Uh, we need to be able to ensure a basic level of access to the internet and access to digital services, especially when we require users or individuals or litigants to communicate with anything that's technology-based. And although it is, although the rates of um, the rates of internet access are different among urban and rural areas and are different within countries. Again, what this can lead to is an issue of exclusion of the most vulnerable and marginalized people, uh, which is something that you see with tech-based solutions in general. So the first thing that we do need to focus on is the fact that everyone is actually able to benefit from the, from the technological interventions that we want to make. Um, the second is on, especially with respect to the judiciary, I think having access to computer systems, digital literacy at all levels of the, ju of the judiciary is important. And especially when we talk about different kinds of AI, I think that's, I mean, one of the things that I think everyone who works with AI uh, can agree on is that nobody can really agree on what AI is. So depending on the kind of tools, it becomes necessary to also make it very clear what the limitations of, um, of the tools are. Uh, so, for example, if you're talking about predictive policing or when we're talking about risk assessment tools that are used in uh, sentencing or used in assessing bail applications, for example, the fact that a software tells you that someone is more likely to um, re-offend doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the metrics that, it, that were used uh, to come up with that output. And so, especially as a judge, as a police officer, as someone who's making decisions that affect the liberty of an individual based on what a software system says, it's important to know what the limitations of these kind of systems are. 
Um, and the third is, I guess this is again like a more basic infrastructural kind of issue, is that a lot of, um, especially when we're talking about things like digitizing case records, right? A lot of it relies on, as the first step, making sure that you have machine readable versions of documents. And now if you have, like I come from India, there are a number of vernacular languages uh, across different states. In trial courts, you have very little that's, that's, uh, that is written in English. And so you have to first transcribe. You have to have machine reading systems that are able to accurately transcribe what a case document says, which is usually handwritten, to be able to do any kind of like further processing on that. And as currently, at least, the rates of accuracy of these kind of technologies is very low. Um, and so that is sort of a basic build, like stumbling block when you come to, for example, undertaking things like trying to analyze what a decision is saying or like uh, trying to figure out what a piece of evidence, summarize a piece of evidence for a judge, right? So you need to be able to actually tell what the document says. So I guess what I'm trying to get at with, um, with this is that even at a more basic, like more simple interventions, for example, even things like um, creating a case docket, a case list, to make it more efficient can have significant impacts on justice delivery, uh, especially when people figure out how to game the system or if there are factors that aren't taken into account um, you, when making these assessments, right? Um, so the second and maybe <laughs> what I'll spend the most amount of time on is on the importance of trust in the judiciary. The whole, the whole uh, basis of trust, uh, the whole basis of legitimacy of the judicial system is trust. And so there are two significant issues that AI systems can, uh, can impose here. So one is with respect to the nature of algorithms themselves. And the second is with respect to the actors who develop and, um, and license these algorithms. So I think here it's useful to maybe just think about what we're discussing. So usually when we talk about AI, we're talking about machine learning algorithms, which basically their whole goal is to be able to perform a task by learning from previous data and without being specifically told how to do something. So this can lead to very unexpected and interesting outcomes, but it also can mean that it's very unclear how they arrived at those outcomes. So now that leads to two issues. One is what you call the black box problem, which is that it's very hard to understand the, the reasoning behind decisions, which can make it very difficult to understand whether or not an outcome is fair. So especially for things like, um, so there is, uh, there's Compass, which is a tool that has been used in the US to assess the risk of pre-offense um, for, uh, for people who've been convicted to see what their uh, likelihood, uh, as in to make decisions based on detention, parole, sentencing, etc. So now, if you are a person on whom this tool has been used and you have been assessed to be high risk, it's very hard to understand what the basis of that, of that assessment is and if they're making the use of protected characteristics, for example, or if it's discriminatory or biased, for example, there's no real way for you as a litigant to be able to understand or seek redress for, for, um, for outcomes that are based on AI systems, right? The second is also on ascribing liability and accountability. So for example, when an AI system or when a software makes a false a wrong decision or is discriminatory or leads to outcomes that are unfair in whatever way. Who exactly do you hold liable? Because you can't really hold software liable. So then do you hold the person who developed it liable, which is a whole team of people? Do you hold the person who made a decision based on that liable? So again, you know, we need to think about this before we start deploying AI systems, right? The other thing is that the judicial process is based on the concept of explainability. The fact is that you need to understand, this is why you have the reason for decisions being made available, right? Like the fact that you need to understand the reasoning behind a judgment, the reasoning behind a decision, so that you can assess and contest that decision. And so any kind of AI tool that you use in a judicial context needs to have very high explainability standards so that people are able to contest it where it leads to outcomes that they think is biased or unfair. So partly this could include things like, very basically things like, uh, the factors that are used in assessing the outcome, the role of human actors in, in the algorithmic development process, uh, what the input data is, what the different weights are that are given to different factors, things like this, right? Now, the second broad bucket um, of issues that I was talking about with respect to transparency is on who designs the software uh, that is being deployed in these systems. So now, in most cases, algorithms and software is being designed by private sector institutions, which have 
proprietary on proprietary software and so you don't really have transparency into some of the things that i said like the factors that are used in um in making assessments the kind of like weightage that's given to different factors for example but also you don't have any kind of audits so it's not possible for someone to go out and see if there are if if, if for example a software is leading to biased outcomes before it's deployed so what this essentially means is that there is a this there's a lack of accountability it's very hard to hold someone accountable when nothing about the way that the system operates or nothing about the way that uh, yeah where nothing about the way the system operates is made clear so for example um there was a case where the the michigan's unemployment benefit system was had incorrectly flagged over 34000 people of uh, fraud which meant that they lost all their unemployment benefits they were a lot of them had to face bankruptcy a lot of them lost their houses so this had very significant implications for the rights of all of these 34000 people who were incorrectly again flagged as being fraudulent and i think later it was found that the error rate for that software was well over 90% so this is a very basic example of how this could have been a very easily avoided outcome had there been more audits had there been more consultation had there been more information about the kind of information that the algorithm was accounting for in making its decisions similarly compass which i just spoke about is a private it had been developed by uh, by a private company it relies on proprietary algorithm that makes any kind of auditing impossible and so there was a study that later found that um black defendants were far more likely to be tagged higher risk of reoffense than uh, white defendants and this was false um, incorrectly tagged it as being uh, as being um at a higher risk of reoffending and so there are some studies that you can do once an algorithm has already been deployed uh, but again at that point it might be too late because you have a lot of people potentially depending on the scale of deployment whose rights have already been infringed by by a system right now the last kind of concern that i want to highlight very quickly i know i'm <laughs> probably running short of time is just on privacy so i'm going to keep it very short and just talk about primarily the issue uh, comes with what kind of data sets are being used by uh, developers to train algorithms so how is the information collected and is that is the information that's being used disproportionate to the purpose that's being uh, that's meant to be served right for example uh i think they found that ha uh, heart which is a system that's used in the uk similar to for for identifying the risk of reoffense again used existing police data it uh, used postcode data but also i think used uh, data from a data broker right which again i think there were concerns about where the data broker got, uh, got the information from and i think again so concerns were raised about the fact that it was from illegal sources so again when it comes to something like this how 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 legal how morally right how ethical is it to use data sets that have been collected illegally is one thing that we have to consider and secondly also what kind of information is useful or like what kind of information should be fed into this so predictive policing models that rely on social media posts for example now is that a valid source of information for making decisions um based on something that might be totally unrelated right so these are broadly the concerns very quickly again i think there are a few ways to address this one is to just figure out whether we really need to be using ai in a system just because we can doesn't necessarily always mean that we should so i think there is a conversation about what kind of tools you want to use at what stage in the judicial process and even when you do use tools the need for public consultations is paramount before a system is adopted so that you can figure out what the potential pitfalls are the need for audits again similarly so you can see if there are biased or unfair outcomes um the need for uh, small scale deployment pilot projects cannot be overstated because again like a lot of things might show up only when you actually deploy the software that you weren't prepared for and so doing it on a smaller scale prepares you for what you can expect at a larger scale and then also having monitoring and review processes to address some of these issues as they come up um so yes i mean those would be great uh, great steps to take once you do figure out that you want to use ai <laughs> Thank you so much, Aishwarya. Uh, this was really important. Um, mainly, uh, you highlighted the challenges like exclusion, uh, the importance of trust and the black box problem, but also the privacy challenges and also a few ways forward. Thank you for pointing out to that too. We will now come back uh, to the African continent uh, and I will invite Linda Bonnieu, the founder of Lawyers Hub Africa, to speak. Linda is a digital expert working on digital policy and justice innovation within the African continent. She's also the CEO and founder of the Lyos. The floor is yours in five minutes, please.
Um, thank you very much. I was trying to share my screen and then all my secrets um, <laughs> came up on here. Um, but I wanted to just share a bit about um, the work that we do. And um, okay, just one minute. I will stop my video. Um, yeah. I was just going to share about a few things. A lot has been said, and I'm not going to bore you. But I wanted to share highlights from a report that we did recently. It's um, a report on AI and justice in Africa. Um, and um, we launched it last week at the Africa Legal Innovation Week. Um, and there are a few learnings that um, I think it's, use it's useful to share. One about digitalization, um, about the concept around artificial intelligence and what's actually happening in the continent is using um, this digitalization powered by virtual courts. Um, and so when I'm talking about lack of data, which was pre-COVID, we have now a lot of African courts really taking up the use of um, um, the use of, um, of virtual courts. And so it's powering everything else uh, within that context. So we have digital payment systems and people really going for um, the use of, and I like the first uh, presentation um, that was done um, by OPE around you know, payments and assessment of fees um, and bonds as well. And so we're seeing that happening a lot um, within, within the African, you know, um, context. I'd also want to um, say the second point around it is um, the question I must answer is what's the changing role of the lawyer and what should be, you know, um, done by lawyers in this specific context. So one of the things that we're seeing um, for lawyers now um, is uh, really uh, case management systems, the need to speak uh, you know, coherently within the justice sector. So even as the judiciary is adopting of the use of technology, uh, we see bar associations actually coming up with um, um, new ways in which they are managing advocates and verifying advocates. And so on a larger scale, we see the need for concerted efforts around digital issues that we're talking about, even within the context of digital trade. And so because now justice is now being productized. And so how are we looking at digital identity for lawyers? Because we've had issues around verification of who is a lawyer and who's not a lawyer. And that's really a, a, a big issue across the African continent. Um, and so the second issue that we are also seeing was, you know, um, and we see justice following the same patterns of technology adoption within the African continent. So you see Nigeria and South Africa and Kenya and Morocco and Egypt really being um, drivers of change within the tech ecosystem, but then also the same um, following within the judicial um, sector as well. Um, I'd also want to talk about, you know, the lawyer as a strategic litigator. We see new aspects of people really pushing for their rights. There are conversations happening around bias of AI systems in digital lending, which digital lending has been a, a huge issue in Kenya. And the central bank now coming into force and you know, issuing guidelines around that. Um, and then we see data protection regimes now uh, within the continent now having clauses around automated decision-making processes and saying that any automated decision-making process should ideally be supervised by a human being, um, which is really relevant for the judicial sector as well. Um, and so what's the changing role of a lawyer in this? That the lawyer and the judge now needs to be a computational expert. And we had sessions last week on discussions around should lawyers code, should judges really get to code as well, um, so that they actually understand the thinking around um, data sets and machine learning that get us to you know, um, artificial intelligence. And how do we also drive adoption? We've seen contexts around the African continent where capacity building is focusing on, on infrastructure and laptops and iPads when the person who's using this technology really does not, is not really shifted in, in mindset. And so there's a need for capacity building in digital skills for the justice sector, especially the lawyers and, and the judges, and to see how to get them to adopt these specific technologies. Because without data, we can't really build, you know, um, accurate data sets and, and build um, a really great judicial system. I also want to mention something that you talked about. Um, I think you mentioned this case of Eric Wisconsin, uh, Eric Loomis versus Wisconsin State, where the Compass, you know, um, technology was used to determine whether he was going to be a repeat offender or not. And I think that really um, drives us towards, one, on strategic litigation, but then also, two, to really build up data sets that are relevant to the African continent because our technology that we are using is foreign and it's private um, and mostly it's American um, and our digital policy is mostly European, then how do we balance those interests and ensure that our judicial 
systems also mirror the African context um, in that sense. I think my final comment would be on the role of the um, judge is, is our courts, are our courts going to be the courts of first instance or are AI systems going to be the, the, the first instance? Um, and this we've seen lately from China um, where you now have AI systems making a decision first and then the judge then now reviews that decision rather than having the judge first and then um, you know having the machine review that specific one. And I think for Africa that's suffering case backlog, uh, which is a huge issue and I like what um, Ope you know, highlighted on the time frame for deciding cases to be more than 10 years in certain instances when things can be you know, changed, shifted and decided within, within a year. I think I think that's something that we need to look at. My final comment would be, um, you know, um, to see ways in which we are working on this. The Lawyers Hub is working actively. Um, we have a digital policy institute that's training. We're working together with judges, telco operators, and we have different courses. Um, and we convene the Africa Law Tech Festival, which really focuses on capacity building to get Africa to the next level. Since 2000. Since 2019, we've trained over 10,000 lawyers to get them to really understand this, um, these specific issues within artificial intelligence. And so if you really need to read the report on AI and judicial systems in Africa, you can find it on lawyershub.org. I think it really offers great insights. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, so much uh, for this presentation and highlighting the change in roles, both of lawyers and of judges, and also pointing out that automated processing should be overlooked by humans and the need, of course, for capacity building. And uh, we have all heard about uh, UNESCO's work in this domain. We will hear now more about uh, this from our colleague, my colleague, our colleague, Misesako Ito, who is UNESCO's CI advisor, CI advisor a regional advisor for Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, your work, you're based in Nairobi, and I'm gonna give you the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cedric, and I will be really brief for the sake of time, and I will be repeating some of the points uh, already that has been laid by the panelists, but also by the introduction of uh, our Assistant Director General for Communication and Information. But UNESCO has uh, undertaken uh, in 2021 the Need Assessment Survey uh, on AI for Africa. And uh, one of the, the most important recommendations arising from that survey is the need for capacity building for AI governance uh, uh, within the executive, legislative, but also the judiciary. So uh, that's why, uh, as our um, uh, ADG mentioned, we, we have a project that is called Judges Initiative, where we train over 24,000 judges on the international standards of freedom of expression and the safety of journalists. And we added a new module on AI and the rule of law. And we had a first uh, pilot training of that module, which was a physical training with the uh, Eastern African Court of Justice uh, very recently in, um, in September. Uh, to highlight, you know, what our previous speakers mentioned, what are the benefits in adopting AI in, uh, in justice system, but also what are the risks associated by uh, integrating uh, AI in the system, including the implication to human rights. And uh, the, the training was uh, extremely successful. Uh, because first, AI is being used in judicial processes by already uh, several courts in, um, in the world. But a lot of cases relating to AI uh, has been taken to the court because this is an area where we still do not have uh, our regulations uh, on the use. So uh, UNESCO will be continuing these uh, capacity building programs. And uh, we will be also uh, working with the, um, with the African Court on Human and People's Rights and also the ECOWAS Court. Uh, and lastly, another point that I wanted to mention in addition to this uh, capacity building for AI uh, in Africa, and I, I think my previous, our previous panelists have already raised that, uh, we hold uh, a regional Southern African Forum on AI uh, in September this year. 
and uh, the, the forum was the first forum to build uh, public awareness on the technical dimension of AI, but also on the ethical and human rights dimension, and building also the ownership and the leadership of African countries on these technologies. And uh, one of the key outcomes, so in relations to the, uh, in addition to the capacity building that has been raised uh, in the uh, outcome document, which is available like uh, WINDOC declarations, is uh, the need for uh, decolonize the data set on AI because uh, currently the AI technologies rely on uh, low quality and non-representative data uh, from African countries with limited uh, data on local languages which uh, do not reflect over thousands of uh, languages that are being used uh, in Africa. So there is a need to work more on uh, data uh, decolonizations and ownership in addition to capacity building. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Miseko. Now I hand over the floor to participants here in the room. Uh, you please raise your hand if you want to speak, have a question, and want to intervene. And uh, the same for people online. Um, please do raise uh, your hands and uh, or put a question into the chat. Thank you. That's okay. So please introduce yourself, and then we'll listen to you. Okay, thank you. My name is my name is Tesfaye. I am a vice president for Federal First Instance Court and a spokesperson for uh, Ethiopian Federal Courts. And uh, the today's presentation, the panelists, it is. Uh, highly, highly related with uh, uh, judiciary, and as you know, it was that judiciary is a conventional and international institutions. Therefore, I feel that we can adopt and adapt some of the uh, AI and uh, digital products to our court system. Um, having said that, uh, we in Ethiopia have uh, um, also a legal framework that. Uh, uh, helps us to use AI and uh, digital products to entertain cases. Uh, but uh, I feel that uh, the experience of Nigeria and India uh, is a telling one. I think we can learn from them. Um, and having said that, there are some things that I want to share. Uh, this AI, how we need to use it in our court system, in the justice systems. Uh, and I think the data that we are going to, to use, that we are going to inculcate in our uh, justice system should be protected because those data are inextricably linked with uh, rights, with the interests, with uh, life, uh, with the property uh, of uh, the litigants. Uh, therefore, the cyber security, the data security that uh, we are uh, you, that we are launching that we are installing in our court system should be highly protected. Uh, that is the first thing that I want to add. The second one is interoperability is also I think is very important. <laughs> Uh, be, be, be because if uh, the judiciary is having its own system, ICT, ICT system, and the police and the prosecution of its uh, prison administration, then it's, 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 not, it's going to be uh, a fragmented one. Therefore, having an interoperable uh, AI system or the ICT system is, I think, is very critical. Uh, what we have is like a fragmented one, a piece one. The court will come up with its own, with its own project and the judiciary, the others will come up with their, with their own. That's, I think, is a problem. And the third one that I want to, to, to add is that uh, 
attitude is i think one of the problem that we have in 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 our in our in our not only the Ethiopian judiciary but also internationally because if you want to 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 come up with a new project with a new ict product then uh, the the court as it is a conservative institution they say that uh, we want to carry out our responsibilities, our businesses with the previous laws. Therefore, attitudinal change is, I think, very important. The final point, the final point I want to raise is that uh, UNESCO uh, is uh, uh, giving different trainings for, 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 for lawyers, for judges. There is a big appetite here in Ethiopia for the federal courts, for the federal judges. Uh, we want to use AI. We want to, 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 to catch up with cyber justice to do that, we need to create an appetite in our judges. To do that, I think giving a training is, is very important. Therefore, uh, the uh, Federal High Court President, His Excellency Brana Meskal is also here, and I'm also representing the Federal First Instance Court. I think we can, we can discuss later in how to, to, to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. We will have now uh, first, and uh, oh, there are several people. I will ask you to please keep it caught, even though uh, short. I um, I really uh, would love the interventions, would have a lot, a lot to say, and I think my co-panelists too. Um, but let's keep it short so that a few more people can intervene. I want to first, as uh, somebody online raised the hand, we will try to connect Nicholas and Lennon, Anan, and then it's cut uh, for me. Uh, the name if we can hear you at a distance please intervene hello can you hear me please yes okay thank you very much so i just wanted to say that there are obvious benefits for the adoption of ai but my caution particularly within africa is that we should be careful not to chase the buzzword without laying the foundational structures for it and I say this, I say this because uh, in 2019, Ghana launched an e-justice system, which was supposed to facilitate filing and make court cases run faster. But in adopting the system, only one courthouse provided the infrastructure necessary to do the scannings and the filings of the cases. And so now you actually spend more time filing and getting your case to the courts than the manual system used to operate. So it is important we get the foundational structures right so that when the system falls into it, it operates seamlessly. Otherwise, we get a counter-effective result if we just chase the buzzword of artificial intelligence in the sector. Thank you. And Thank you so much for this intervention. I think uh, many people will agree uh, with your point and have um, some experiences. Now, I think another person, another two, wanted to intervene. Please, um, who had the mic? Is it still back with me? Oh, no. Can you please hand over the mic? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Nana Kofi Asafuedu, um, Executive Director of the Ghana Domain Name Registry and Chair of the Ghana IGF. Um, I just have three points to make. I, I came here because I wanted to, I was curious about the use of artificial intelligence as related to justice. Um, a lot of representation has been between digitalization, which is separate from what I consider to be artificial intelligence, which is basically machines doing the work of humans as far as they can go. So I want to know whether we have any intent of separating uh, those two concepts or we're going to be discussing them together. Uh, and, and if so, how, how, how do we do that? And whether it's a, it's a better approach. The second thing is um, I, I'm very excited to see that AI can be used to speed up the judicial processes. But um, I'm a little concerned that uh, artificial intelligence can be used to make judgments 
because I don't even think that the, the problem of uh, natural language processing has been solved. I think that uh, when it comes to a point where any AI can fully understand text and all these nuances, that's when it can then now be asked to make a judgment. Because even today, if you put words in Google to translate from one language to the other, it, it still makes uh, small mistakes. And the, and the third one is uh, that uh, uh, Ashwarya talk, talked about the fact that before systems can be used to make judgments, they have to do uh, a lot of test uh, consultation. And I want to add that it's also a matter of having very high standards and regulations for software testing. Because a lot of software can be written and deployed and nobody knows what systems uh, assurance, testing, rigorous uh, tests have been done before it's used. Because if uh, uh, software that is used to judge cases is tested on a lot of dummy cases, a lot of uh, uh, false positives are definitely going to come out. So it's a matter of uh, software testing regulation as well. Thank you. Uh, I know we are a little bit over time, uh, but I will want to let, uh, give the floor uh, to, the third, uh, to the fourth person here. Just as it re with regards to the session, I want to say something that, uh, of course, uh, we have a large definition of AI, and you're right that sometimes between digital, digitalization, digital transformation, and AI, there are you know, overlapping areas. But we had a number of examples where it was really AI. If we were speaking about AI-assisted document review, uh, Mr. Logasa mentioned that, but also the other cases and examples from Ms. Girida on accountability and trust were really AI-related. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brian Meskel. I'm from here, Ethiopia, Federal High Court President, and my colleague, uh, Vice President for Federal Affairs and Stance, uh, Mr. T uh, Tasfai explained earlier. We are, I just first uh, would like to thank you for your wonderful presentations, uh, really the Nigerian experience, the Indian experience that are uh, inspiring us. Uh, my reflection is very short and uh, it's clear that just to reflect that we have high interest in, in introducing, using technologies. The, the Ethiopian government in general and the institutions, artificial, uh, Ethiopian Artificial in, uh, Intelligence Center and the judiciary, federal judici judiciary is highly interested in modernizing the judiciary, the service system. Uh, so without technology, there is no access to justice. Uh, access to justice is uh, rights of human being. So we cannot ensure unless we use these technologies. Uh, as we used to deliver justice manually, it is going to take time. Uh, there is delays. Uh, as we all know, uh, justice delays, justice denied. We don't have any excuses uh, not to use these technologies because technology is uh, timely, efficiently uh, helps to deliver uh, justice. So really, uh, I just want to emphasize, let us work together. Uh, Ethiopia population is 120 million people. Uh, if we are going to reach this all people, we used to uh, put in place technologies, relevant technologies. Technologies have been proving themselves, they are efficient elsewhere, why not here? Every The global communities, human being is everywhere, human being. So uh, uh, we don't give some excuses, but we need to make sure uh, scale up the best practices as well. Just my emphasis is let us work together, let us collaborate, let us build capacity, let us ex exchange experiences. Uh, as that's all my reflection. Thank you very much.
Um, thank you so much, Mr. President, Mr. Fellow High Court, to join this session. And we are, of course, uh, very happy uh, to join forces and work together and for your interest in joining. Now I will give the floor very rapidly. In a one or two minute, you can uh, respond by our panelists. Um, I hand over the floor first. Um, thank you very much for the questions. My name is Linda Bonio from Kenya. And um, I think I'm, I'm just going to say uh, the point on interoperability is really important. And I think that the justice sector has been removed from efforts around digital policy. And that's, I think that's the missing link within the justice sector. We overfocus on what's happening in the judiciary, but then we are not engaged on how do we get meaningful access? And I think IGF is a really great platform to bring those two ideas on justice innovation, but then also digital policy. And that's the gap that the lawyers are really striving to, to get to. And when we talk about interoperability, <coughs> sorry, there's a lot of discussions that are siloed. Judiciary is on its own, lawyers on their own, and the digital policy movement is actually on its own. I think there needs to be a speaking together. And what I talked about um, around payments on one side and looking at data on the other side, they all need to speak to each other. And then I think finally, I think we didn't talk too much about AI, especially myself, because of the stage of development. Okay, uh, I'm gonna give it back to her once <laughs> once she's had some water, I think. Um, no, I just wanted to, I guess, re-emphasize uh, one of the points that was made, which is with respect to the need for data security, and uh, more specifically, at least the way that I think about it, uh, the importance of robust data protection laws uh, around around any information that we want to um, that we want to deploy in the judiciary because of the sensitivity of the information and the impact of rights uh, on rights that it is likely to have. So I'm just re-emphasizing that. Um, I also just want, I guess I was a little bit unclear on what interoperability would mean in this context because if we're talking about like more easy data sharing that again, I think might need to, I think we might need to assess how, what levels of anonymization what data security practices, et cetera, we have before we're able to share across um, across different sectors of the government. Um, uh, but yes, now I, I can see that you've had some water, so maybe. Okay, uh, the bottles, bottle refused to open. My enemy, enemies in my village are working too hard. <laughs> but I just want to say one last comment. I think on interoperability, um, if you study the justice sector, it's not working in coherence, especially around around platforms, like we are trying to platformize everything that's happening. And if you look at the example of, uh, I'll give an example um, about Nigeria and what Law Pavilion is doing, they're, they're way ahead what the judiciary is doing. And there's a need as, as um, prosecutors are building, as lawyers are building case management systems, bar associations are working together. Everything I think needs to feed into each other and then you know, within the justice sector, look at issues of digital identity together, digital payments together. These conversations are actually happening outside the judici um, judicial system, but then we really haven't caught up on those conversations. Um, and so I think interoperability in that case means speaking to each other without necessarily sharing data. And I think Estonia is a great example on how you can just have a gateway rather than really having everybody, you know, share the same sort of data um, and then platformize everything. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. I will now give also the opportunity uh, to Mr. Ole Olugasa to um, intervene at a distance. One minute, please. No, I think the, your, your mic is muted. Yes, the mic. Now it should be possible. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, the host did it to allow me to unmute myself. Okay, th thank you very much. I think um, Linda has already um, spoken on, on the issue of interoperability, and I can't, I, I can't agree more um, because it's important that we consider all the stakeholders of the justice sector. Most discussions on technology and justice system 
takes into consideration the judges and the lawyers. But the critical stakeholder, that's the common man on the street, is usually left out of this discussion. So I, I also think um, that the interoperability should link the three stakeholders. So I really agree with Linda that we should platformize it. It should, it should be a system where all the three stakeholders have access to justice. The lawyers can work seamlessly, connect with the court, the court can um, access data, and then the general populace can also follow through with litigation, with online, um, with, with, with dispute resolution. I think that's the way to go. And how artificial intelligence will um, help in galvanizing all this together. For us at Lopa, that's really what we are concentrating on now. How the common man can have easy access to justice, can supply information to the judicial system. Yes, it's going to be a lot, it's going to be a lot of information, but then because of artificial intelligence, the justice and the judges can easily sift through this information and come up with their decisions. Thank now, you. Those are the, the things that are interesting to us that we're actually working on. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Rugasa. Um... Oh, yes, uh, just uh, very briefly to share that, uh, yes, we very much welcome a collaboration with the Federal High Court of Ethiopia, so we can exchange contact after that. And uh, I will not be commenting on the interoperability, but uh, UNESCO's approach uh, relating to the AI is to raise uh, public awareness, uh, build capacity on the risks and benefit of AI, especially its uh, implications to the human right and also addressing uh, the data gap that we have uh, in Africa on technology development. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry I see that the more people have raised their hands uh, online, but we're already 15 minutes late, so I'll be closing now um, the session uh, by thanking first the panelists uh, online and, and here in the room, um, the very active audience uh, online also and, and here in the audience. Also, my colleague uh, Charlene Dutron, who did an incredible job in putting uh, this session together. Everyone here on the panel knows her well who has been um, working hard on this. And I think now we know and understand better why digitalization and AI matter for the justice system on the continent, uh, but also on, on the globe. Um, uh, we also learned about the, the need about uh, more capacity building for just the judiciary, for the ju justice actors in this field. And we will consider also the lessons learned in this and other occasions in designing a new training toolkit. We are working on that now. Uh, but in the meantime, I invite all of you to register for the massive open online course on AI, which we have, um, which will give you a good start to um, on this topic if you haven't, um, if you want more. So thank you so much to all of you. And, um, and I look forward to seeing and working with you in the future. Goodbye. Just, uh, uh, I didn't see that. Oh, I'm sorry, I just closed. But I, I just now, I think Judge Dr. Obena has been able to join. And we would like to listen. I would love to listen. I mean, and everybody's uh, free uh, to, um, to, to join me, please. Um, one or two minutes, please, um, after closing, a little delight uh, from you, uh, Judge Dr. Obena. And I'm sorry we had the technical difficulties, and I'm delighted that you're on now. I think the the voice is not clear. The host has just okay. Hello, everybody. Yes. Thank you very you much. I I hope you can hear me very well. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had a, some kind of technology hiccup, but uh, luckily, uh, Shalina has done a very good job, and I'm online now. I will say a few. Uh, words because I have been given two minutes um, to say a word or two. Uh, we, uh, I would say we have the potential uh, of using AI in administration of justice. Uh, and I think it's very useful uh, because then Africa has a disadvantage of having 
uh, many problems. We have corruption, we have um, a digital divide. Uh, we also have very few uh, judicial officers, uh, but the population is booming. So then we can use AI to at least uh, assist us in administration of justice. How? I would say, for example, in case management systems, we could use AI for that. And even in uh, some of decision making at the judiciary, uh, where you have like uh, what we call uh, small claims, uh, traffic cases, for example, some of the cases that do not really require many hours for trial that are not technical, we can simply use AI for that. Uh, of course, I know uh, in Tanzania, for example, we have recently procured a system for uh, recording of court proceedings and also trans trans transcribing those proceedings. So this system will help us uh, to do away with, uh, I mean, handwriting, I mean, where you have to, uh, to write by hand all the proceedings. So then now the technology could do that. And that I think is fantastic. Uh, however, I have heard uh, some of the speakers, which I really subscribe to that. We are very far from robotic judges. Uh, we, I mean, at least in the foreseeable future, this is not easy unless uh, we applied for uh, some uh, limited cases like traffic cases where you can have automated billing. Uh, I mean, like uh, the camera could be installed in a highway and then record the speeding and then you get the bill. This has been done in Europe and so it's not a problem at all in some countries of, uh, of Africa as well. So for me, I think AI is very important and it's crucial because even uh, when we talk of digital divide, some uh, say, for example, the citizens do not uh, have the knowledge or not, are not aware of this. But if you use AI, applications, for example, uh, we have Siri uh, and other uh, assistants, uh, like Google Assistant. We can use the same for, uh, I mean, the judicial services where you go to the website of the judiciary and then you just have question and answer section. You chat with a robot there uh, and it will give you, uh, the, for example, you want to open, uh, say, uh, the, the uh, breach of contract case, you have a claim, or maybe any other case relating to tort, this uh, chatbot will tell you what to do if you want to open up, uh, say, the administration of a state case, you want to be appointed as administrator, and then you, this chatbot will tell you how to file your case uh, and all the procedures. So in this case, we find that AI can also play a role in providing legal education. I mean, in supplying information that otherwise would need a lawyer's advice. So I shouldn't take much of the time, but let me conclude by saying that AI is potential, especially for countries in Africa where we have problem with the digital divide and also we have few judges or uh, court officers. AI can help us to do away with or to deal with the, all these problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Let me end up there. I shouldn't take much of your time. I'm sorry for coming late. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Dr. Obina. And I was, uh, it was a very good closing with a few practical examples too um, you gave. And I'm happy we were able to connect at the end uh, still. And I thank again all the panelists, the participants online and in the room for hanging in here with us. It's the last session, I think, in terms of timing of the AGF. And I wish you a very good evening and, and thank you again. And we'll work together. Thank you.